But it's one of those typical Hollywood things, you know, it's like on the Friday, you're going, oh, you know, the director's going, oh, I love this stuff, I can't stop humming it. Monday, you're fired. Oh, you know, it's like, okay. My name is John Doran, and I write about music. In this series of British Masters for Noisy, I have been speaking to such outliers in the field of popular music as Richard Ashcroft, Viv Albertine and Jimmy Page. Today I am talking to former rock musician and now composer Clint Mansell. Unlike any of the other interviewees on British Masters, Mansell has had two separate musical careers of note, which, on the surface at least, don't have any connection. His raucous Scribo band Pop Will Eat Itself lurched out of Stourbridge in 1986, and while often reviled in the press, they were experimental, highly popular, and quite unlike anything that had come before. When the Poppies split in 96, Mansell staked everything on a fresh roll of the dice and moved to America to try and become a soundtrack composer. After scoring the Darren Aronofsky films Pie and Requiem for a Dream, it became clear this gamble had paid off, and now he is one of Hollywood's most in-demand musicians. Clint Mansell, welcome to British Masters. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? I'm all right, thanks, how are you? Yeah, I'm not bad. When I talk to someone who's like lived away from home abroad as for as long as you have, I think it's like two decades now for you, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. I was wondering, what does it even mean to you to be described as being British? Is it something you think about? I don't know that I think about it really. Living in Los Angeles, I do. It's very easy to feel like an alien there anyway, you know the football, stuff like that, all my references are still very British, you know, so I, I haven't become an American citizen and all that sort of stuff. So the one thing I've tried to do is just, just to be myself, you know, because for ages when I was making music, even, you know, going back to the Pop Will Eat Yourself days, it's like, you know, you, you're sort of heavily influenced by things, you know, and I remember thinking one time, why, why don't my songs sound as good as the Chemical Brothers, you know, and or the Prodigy or something? And the, you know, after a while I come to realise that, well, you, you know, you're not those people, you know, why don't you really just be yourself, you know, and focus on whatever it is that you may have. One of the more recent films that you've scored, High Rise, mm -hmm. by Ben Wheatley. I was wondering, do you ever, ever venture into the cinema to watch one of the films that you've worked on, or have you just totally had enough of it by that point? I don't really like things like premieres and that sort of stuff. I very rarely go to those, although I did go to the Toronto Film Festival with High Rise last September because I believed in the film so much and I just wanted to be, you know, supportive and be part of it. But quite often by the time I'm done, I'm sort of, I could be well sick of it, you know. And also as well, you, you, for a while, you only see the mistakes. You know, sometimes it's just best to give yourself a bit of distance from it. So I'm curious about the process. How early, say, in the example of High Rise, would Ben Wheatley get in touch with you? And also, it's your first collaboration, isn't mm -hmm. it? So how would he make an approach and what would he suggest to you? I think I was following Ben on, on Twitter and he'd read some interview somewhere that, that I said that I liked his work. He had said, that, you know, he never would have thought of contacting me because he just thought I wouldn't be interested, you know, I was too big for that type of thing or something, you know. And uh, yeah, and we, we just talked on Skype the first time and uh, we talked for about two hours just about, you know, music, movies, just stuff we liked. So I then read the script and I reread the book as well, you know, just to sort of get back up to speed, if you like. And I think, you know, growing up in the West Midlands in the sort of 70s and 80s gives you a pretty good Ballardian view, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. And he, his work was so prescient, you know, and, and a lot of things that we, you know, he, he saw coming. He's quite a visionary, you know. And, and Ben is at a, a, a point in, in his career, I think, where he's starting to get some reasonable money to be able to... to, to fulfill his uh, visions, if you like. He's very clear about who he is and what he wants and how he sees things. Why don't you come up later and have a drink? You don't know how things work around here, do you? I'm a fast learner. I was all set to do uh, High Rise and um, my girlfriend died just as I was about to start and uh, I had to pull out, I couldn't do it, you know, yeah. I was devastated as you might imagine, but Ben totally understood, you know, I mean obviously, and um, I came over to England to see my parents and got in touch with Ben just to meet up and say hello and whatever, and uh, we were in the George up the street there, you know, on Wardour Street, and uh, eight pints later, he, he just said, look, he said, you know, he said, I'd love you to do it, he said, what about if we wait for you, you know, if, if do you think you'd, you'd you know, 
you might feel up to it. And it was such a beautiful human thing to do. They don't do that in Hollywood, you know, and that to me just makes the experience even better because you, you're working with people who, who care. Is there a therapeutic effect to your work, to writing music? I mean, I'm a very anxious person. My whole life is riddled with anxiety. And when I make a piece of music that has anxiety in it, it's like it cancels out my own. So I kind right. of find this peace in it, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. and maybe it's something to do with that, you know? The inclusion of things like ABBA on several different levels mm. is really masterfully done, I think. And uh, what, what, what was it like working with Matt on the strings for that? We had this sort of like bookend, if you like, of, of ABBA from the SOS orchestral arrangement to, to Portishead's dystopian bleak version, if you like. And then it, coming in with the disco beat on the end, it's just, it's just so sort of like naff, I suppose, you know, but the, that it sort of really encapsulated the, the, the time, if you like. So I was lucky enough a few years back to get to speak to Ennio Morricone, mm -hmm. and obviously the first half of his career was kind of a lot more avant-garde focused, but he still worked in films. Mm -hmm. So he said to me that he would use avant-garde techniques when working with people like Dario Argento on Giallo films mm -hmm. to get inside these deeply traumatic recesses of the character's psychology and these horrible things that had happened to him. Now, you've worked on some films with some deeply traumatic recesses, and I was wondering, you know, specifically, I guess, Black Swan and Requiem for a Dream, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could talk about maybe specific things that you did on either of those films to get to the heart of the horror at some of these characters are experiencing. Take Black Swan, for instance, and obviously it's all built out of Swan Lake. But I took all the music and just started playing with little one bar, two bar loops, taking notes out and sort of stripping it down really and, and maybe finding a little loop in it that I'd go like, oh, that kind of sounds like something I might have done, you know. Feel my touch, respond to it. Come on. I've said this before and it is very pretentious, but it's like, it's like a sculptor says, the statue is already in the marble, I've got to get it out. And to me, the, the score's already written, I've just got to channel it somehow. I do that by spending a lot of time with the film, watching the film laugh at me at my stupid ideas sometimes until finally something kind of sticks. Requiem for a Dream, I had written something like 20 little pieces for Darren. Absolutely nothing worked. The original idea was he wanted it to be very sort of hip-hop influenced because mm. he'd grown up with hip-hop music. There's a scene where um, Ellen Burstyn's character first has the diet pills and, you know, she's all amped up and she's cleaned the apartment and it's all fast. And then they wear off and it all slows down. And he put She Watched Channel Zero by Public Enemy underneath it and it was fantastic. Really, really great. But it actually didn't do anything other than be kind of cool, you know, there was, yeah. no, there was nothing really going on. We tried what would become Luxy Turner, which was, at that point was, wasn't just much more than just the three chords repeating, I, I, I remember. And we put it um, against the scene where Jennifer Connelly's character has slept with the psychiatrist for some money. The, the storm that's been building for the last 30 minutes of the movie explodes as she comes outside, it's thunder and lightning, she throws up. And this piece of music went under it and it was just like, oh my God. I mean, neither of us had any idea what we were doing, really. But we, we just knew that this piece of music just changed everything and we tried it in every pivotal moment in the film, if you like. Requiem for a Dream is a monster movie, Darren says, and the, yeah. the addiction is the monster. So every time the, the monster won, you play the monster's music, which in this case was, was uh, Lux Eterna, you know. What happened with Lux Eterna was quite mad, wasn't it? I guess it must be out of your control when you lose, almost lose control of a piece of music like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's had a far more exciting life than I have probably, you know, I mean, it's turned up in all sorts of places. 
I, you, you were saying <laughs> to go to cinema and see uh, my own stuff, and I generally I don't, but when whoever did it for the, the Two Towers, isn't it, yeah, yeah, Lord yeah. of the Rings, I knew that the trailer was playing before Punch Drunk Love, the Adam Sandler um, PTA film, you know? So I went to see that so I could see the trailer just to see what it was like. There will be no dawn for men. When you're composing for films, and quite a lot of them get shown all over the world in all cinemas. Your music reaches such a colossally big audience. One piece of music might end up on a, an Oscar-nominated film, and then the same piece of music might end up on Top Gear yeah. the next night. Yeah. What are some of the weirder places where you've heard your own music without expecting to? I'm a, I'm a Wolves fan, and um, in 2003, when we were in the championship playoffs against Sheffield United, at the Millennium Stadium in Cardiff. They played that the, the Requiem music as the teams came out onto the pitch, and I thought, oh my God, we're gonna to win today. Right? <laughs> you no, know what, you know, and we did, we won 3-0, so that was, that was a particularly good one. Your roots as a musician go all the way back, I believe, to about 1981. And mm. I was wondering, you know, I'm guessing probably your motivations for making music today are probably different to what they were in 81. But, well, you know, looking back through the mists of time evaporated, what were your primary motivations in starting a band? Trying to make girls, I think. <laughs> and free beer. <laughs> like I've said before, I, I, I'd seen Bowie on top of the Pops doing Starman when I was about, I must have been nine, I think. And I just knew at that point, that whatever this guy had, I wanted some of that. You know, then punk came along and totally took me by the scruff of the neck, you know. And I just always knew that I wanted to try and make up songs and music. Even back when I was in the band, my, one of my favourite things would be if I'd just written a new song, really just playing it to death to myself before anybody had heard it, you know. And it, yeah, it's just very basic but you know you've got something and it's a real thrill. I know my mate Paddy from Mosley he goes poppies they're always skink because they spend all of their money on videos <laughs> <laughs> but yeah and, and it is true it's like you look back and you think god you've got a massive video for every single single yeah but do you really like any of those videos is the one particular video where you think oh we really nailed it there. We did a crazy one with Stephen Wells for RSVP and um it's had the twins out of neighbours in it, and All right. Swells was a maniac, you know. That was the sort of game back then, wasn't it? People made videos, spent a lot mm. of money on videos, which really, I don't know, kind of pointless in some ways. Just one last thing. Say, if someone was coming round to your house and you were going to play some records and stuff like that, if you really wanted to blow someone's mind, what soundtrack record would you put on? Yeah, I recently saw a film called The Cremator. I guess it's probably part of some sort of U Yugoslavian new wave or something like that, made in about 1969. It's about a guy who's a, well, a cremator. He's a, he runs a funeral home and um, he starts bumping people off and it's set in Germany through the 30s and the film ends with the Nazis coming to him for him to help them do their yeah, things, yeah, yeah. you know, and it's just an unbelievable piece of work. One of the, the things about about the internet now, which I think is a shame, is it's it's sort of homogenised our experiences, you know. I can live in LA and do exactly the same things or experience the same things as somebody in London, you know, which is brilliant. But back in the day, everything grew up in isolation and it was a response to what was going on in their, their space, you know. And it creates, you know, wildly different things that we, that we maybe we may be losing. Well, Clint, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks, Thanks very much. much.